Dear students, colleagues and friends, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sarah Nakama and I'm the rector of Truro College Berlin. It is my pleasure to welcome you all also on behalf of the Indonesian Embassy here online. We would have loved to meet you in person, but unfortunately, due to the pandemic, COVID-19, as you all know, it is impossible. On the posit positive side, we have a real international audience this evening, focused on the topic at hand, and we will stream this e event live on Facebook. All this was made possible thanks to the organization of Tal Gibish, our head of the public relations department, and Professor Dr. Adi Marwan, the Indonesian education and culture attaché in Berlin. Indonesia has developed in the last decade to, became, to become a flourishing center of high-tech and startup companies. In addition, it offers various financial and investment opportunities. This is an outstanding chance to learn firsthand about one of the most successful countries in Asia. We will not leave your questions unanswered. Please write your questions in the question and answer session. This, is, this part will be moderated by our Turo College professor, Professor Dr. Anna Klipstam. We at Turo College Berlin and American Jewish College are very proud and honored to host the ambassador of Indonesia, His Excellency Arif Havas Oigroseno who agreed to give us an hour and a half of his valuable time, even though he's out of Berlin today. The, uh, the uh, Ari Papas Orgezono is an ambassador of the Republic of Indonesia to the Federal Republic of Germany. He was sworn in by the president of the Republic of Indonesia in February, 2018. Prior to this, he held the office of vice minister at the Ministry of Maritime Affairs between the years of 2015 and 2018. Before that, he served as an ambassador of Republic of Indonesia to the Kingdom of Belgium, Grand Duchy of Luxembourg, and the European Union from August 2010 till January 2015. In June 2010, he became the first Indonesian to preside over the 20th conference about the Convention on Maritime Law of 1982 at the United Nations headquarters in New York. Ambassador Agreseno is an alumni of Harvard Law School. Please welcome him for his lecture today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rector uh, Nakama, for the warm welcome and kind words uh, for us uh, at the embassy. Uh, to be able to come uh, online uh, in discussions about uh, my country. Um, I understand that the focus of discussion is on the finance, but I don't think I can do justice without uh, sharing with you a larger picture of Indonesia. Then, of course, we will dive in into finance and other interesting issues such as uh, the environment uh, and uh, also uh, economic development and including even uh, how we handle the, the COVID. Then uh, we will we will have a discussion uh, Q&A after that. I have a presentation, it's a very heavy one. It's, uh, uh, it's a, lot of, a lot of pages. I think it's almost 100, but I, I will just go fly through the uh, presentation so that uh, you will not uh, feel bored. 
uh, with uh, my presentation. Hang on a second. Uh, we have it already here. Okay. So. Oh. Voila. So um, actually I'm here in Hanover. Uh, we are preparing for our participation at Hanover uh, Fair next year. Uh, we have become a partner country of Hanover Fair since uh, last year. We are supposed to have it this year, but uh, of course, because of COVID, we could not uh, do that uh, event. So we'll do it uh, for next year. Um, we are going to make a meeting with the CEO of the GMSA uh, for two days to prepare our uh, our uh, participation as official partner country uh, in the 2021. I will just go skip through um, uh, the the um, issue about Hunter for Fair. I'll come back later on if you would like me to explain that. So I believe you know uh, where Indonesia is. All of all of all of you know. Um, Indonesia is in Southeast Asia, but do you have any idea of the scale of the country? I think 90% uh, of you, maybe you don't have any scale of the country. So this is an overlay of map of Indonesia and Asia. So it's, it's, it's stretching from Iran to China uh, and from Central Europe to uh, India. Okay. And if we put this overlay to the US, it's basically from uh, West Coast to East Coast. And if we put Indonesian map to Europe, then it's from Dublin to Sochi. So it's, it's a very big country. It's a very complicated country because we are the largest archipelagic state in the world. We have 17,000 islands plus. So if you want to visit all these islands, it will take you 43 years or so. Uh, we have the second longest coastline in the world, 100,000 kilometers. The longest is still uh, held by Canada. We have over 300 ethnic groups. We have 700 languages, not dialect, languages. And we have three time zones and we have 192 million registered voters so when we had an election last year the the return was 80 percent so it's it's very high uh, because uh, of the young generation who wants to be part of the political uh, development in indonesia so <coughs> excuse me we are quite young country uh, so basically we we 70% of Indonesians are between 16 to 60 years old. So it's, it's we are now enjoying the uh, demographic dividend of uh, Indonesia. And uh, we hope we can still uh, master this as an economic power uh, in the regions and beyond. Uh, this is before COVID, of course. So we are growing of above 5%. It's not seven or it's not eight like China or India, but we are basically growing around five comfortably, uh, where others are going up and down, but we are we are we are still at this rate. Okay. Um, inflation is controllable, Gini ratio it's uh, better now. Unemployment is only five, five point twenty-eight percent, so it's quite quite low. Um we are investment grade, so uh, this is the latest uh, data that we get from Moody's, Fitch Rating, and Standard and Poor. So we are basically doing okay. Our debt to GDP is not high; it's only thirty percent. Okay, actually, it's the lowest uh, if you compare to Thailand, Malaysia, or China. And if you compare with EU, of course, uh, you know it's even very low especially now uh with the uh pandemic coming in even now our our uh, dsr is only about 35 uh, percent so it's still very low and we have quite space uh, margin uh for the microfinance uh, tour household debt is also very low in indonesia it's only 17 percent as opposed to 
other country. But again, um, this also reminds me of someone who said that uh, you know if you want to live better, then you better take a lot of debt. So probably that's why they have a good life in Switzerland because they have a lot of debt there. <laughs> All right, so uh, this is the report from uh, Pricewaterhouse. Of course, this is all before COVID. This is a projections where Indonesian economy is going uh, in 2050. So in 2016, we are ranking eight. In uh, 2030, we will be ranking five and 2050, we'll be ranking four as the uh, largest economy in the world. So you are looking at uh, a very strong possibility, uh, even after COVID, uh, we will probably still be in this trajectory of economic development. Now, if you look at uh, the growth day uh, due to COVID, um, we are, we are we're, we're okay, we are minus uh, uh, 3.4. Uh, we, we had minus five before, but now we are minus 3.4. If you look at uh, different countries in the region, so we are still doing quite um, okay, all right? So where is directions of for the economic recovery? The directions uh, of the economic recovery requires uh, a couple of things. I think number one uh, is simplification of business procedures. We are, uh, one of the most complex place to do business in Indonesia. And if we are not uh, cleaning up our own act, then we are afraid that we will not be able to compete at uh, the global level. So the direction of the economy needs to have a strong fundamentals in terms of uh, ease of doing business. We have a good score, more or less, on the ease of doing business. This is a score that you had from uh, World Economic Forum. Uh, but uh, this is not enough, okay? This is just a um, movement of managing uh, cases, uh, managing difficulties, but not really, uh, you know, uh, going down and cleaning up all these different messes uh, that creates um, bureaucracy. So I'll give you an example here. Uh, I want to be as open and frank as possible. You know, if, uh, if you want to uh, set up a, a company, for instance, business licensing, you have to have a permit from 25 institutions, from many offices, with hundreds of permits, overlapping permits, local, national, we have cartel, monopolistic practices, we have of course the issue of corruption. So this is a, a, a big thing that we have to face. And um, we have just uh, uh, launched a, a new law, it's called the Omnibus Law on Job Creations. And um, this law streamlined 52 laws on um, labor, okay? Uh, we have uh, streamlined 13 laws on investment requirements. We have uh, streamlined uh, nine laws, for instance, for ease of doing business. So you can see here in the list that uh, we have basically uh, a streamlined um, hundreds of laws and, and basically uh, uh, create one omnibus law that will be able to uh, create a very clear way of doing business uh, in the Indonesia, okay? Um, the environmental issue, of course, is still needed because it is some of the very important issue for us. Uh, the high risk uh, business still need environmental uh, assessment uh, from the government. Now, this is probably relevant for you. Um, the omnibus law uh, also allow for the establishment for the first time of the Indonesian Sovereign Wealth Fund. We did not have that before. Now we are developing this uh, Sovereign Wealth Fund uh, Indonesian uh, one. So we hope 
that uh, this will invest, they will, they will attract a lot of uh, uh, investors coming in and starting a discussions uh, with us on this particular uh, aspect. We have a lot of state-owned companies. We have uh, uh, state-owned companies in many different aspects of uh, economy in Indonesia. So it means we have a lot of assets there. And uh, we believe that uh, we can optimize our assets uh, and make it part of the Indonesian sovereign wealth. Fund. Um, investment coming in from abroad, we, we, we have also a streamlined uh, ways of making investment uh, to Indonesia. These are the six issues that we are cleaning up to increase investment from uh, abroad to Indonesia. Um, this is uh, 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 what we call the one-stop shops. So 22 ministries and government institutions are, are basically have their uh, power cut and all uh, streamlined and centered into one office, which is the National Agency for Investment. So if you want to invest in Indonesia, you just go to this office. You can do it online and then this office then will be responsible in that building you have representative from different ministries and they are the one who's going to do uh, the assessment and they are going to give the say offer there so people don't go around different ministries different agencies and get confused along the way so this is one of, of our important aspect of our positions today tax holiday incentive in different aspects of um, indonesian economy we have tax allowance incentive as well uh, for investment coming into Indonesia. We have social super deductible uh, tax. The one in the middle uh, is something that we take from Germany, which is the famous vocational training system in Germany, TVET. Um, we have now uh, introduced the German defense system in Indonesia since a couple of years. And if a company is involved in this uh, defense program, they will get super deductible tax up to 200%. So oh, this is something that is very important. The one on the left is labor intensive industry. Um, this is very important because, as you're probably well aware, there are a lot of uh, investment coming from China and sometimes their investment bring Chinese workers. So in order for us to create a strong uh, labor in Indonesia through education, then if you bring uh, uh, Indonesian more in the business, then you get 60% uh, deductible tax. And if you do R&D, the one on the right, um, you get the super deductible tax uh, by 300%. So if, for instance, you are in the medical business, vaccine business, uh, setting up shops in Indonesia, then you know you get a lot of uh, uh, tax cut with this new uh, regulation. The one, uh, the, the, the reference uh, on the lower side, you see those are 2020, 2020, 2020, those are, those are the reference uh, that this regulation just came up this year. Um, this is uh, the online single submission that I mentioned uh, before. And this is the potential sectors where uh, if you are interested uh, to, to look at investing in the Indonesia. Okay. We have built uh, 15 special economic zone, uh, free trade zones, industrial estates, bonded zone, logistical centers, and uh, tourism center as well. So, so we, in terms of infrastructure, we are ready for foreign investment. These are the, the locations uh, of those uh, places where you can invest with, with uh, many different uh, facilities there, okay? We have just this very interesting one. We just launched a, a with Singapore uh, integrated industrial park, and um, the rumor has it that Tesla is looking at this place uh, to build a battery. Uh, we are still uh, working on that uh, particular aspect because Indonesia is the largest uh, country with uh, nickel in the world. 
So we have all the raw materials. We are now developing the technology. So a foreign investment, we have invited actually uh, BASF and Varta and Volkswagen and BMW to come to Indonesia and build the electric vehicle as well as building uh, battery uh, for cars uh, in Indonesia because we have the zones, we have the facility, we have some technology, you can bring the technology and also we have the raw materials as well. All right, so um, renewable energy, uh, it's a, a big thing for us. If you look at this uh, trajectory uh, in 2013, only 5% uh, our economy is renewable energy. Okay, uh, today, 2020, we have already come into 11%. So 2025, we want to increase to 23%. And 2050, we want to increase all the way up to 31%. So renewable is also part of very important aspect in our, our um, economic uh, development. This is something new also. Uh, this is uh, presidential regulation on renewable electricity pricing. Um, we hope with a good pricing, uh, we will be able to bring in all these investors coming from Europe, especially the one with the strong uh, renewable technologies such as Germany, uh, to come to Indonesia. We have some area in Indonesia where, where we have a very good um, wind power, for instance, but uh, biomass, biogas, geothermal, solar, hydro, there are or are relevant uh, in different parts of uh, Indonesia, all right? Now, digital industry, okay? Uh, our digital industry ranks seven in the world. We have more unicorn than France and Switzerland. This is something that not very many people know, okay? Um, we are ranking seven. We are not far from South Korea or even Germany. So um, we are the only, I would say, um, country other than India and China coming from Asia and South Korea that, 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 uh, that has a very strong digital industry. I'll, I'll show you um, the numbers, okay? So this is the number of the internet economy in, in, in Southeast Asia. In 2015, it was only $32 billion. Last year is $100 billion. In 2025, it will be $300 billion. And Indonesia is the largest. If you look at the, at, at the charts on the left, okay? Um, we have uh, $40 billion now, and we will have $133, $133 billion in 2020. Uh, 25. This is a research coming from Google, uh, and uh, this is done in the 2019. Okay, and if you look at the e-commerce, uh, we are taking the lead. Online travel, we are taking the lead. Online media, we are taking the lead. Ride hailing, we are taking the lead. Okay, e-commerce will hit. 82 billion dollars in 2025 it's a big money there um there are 11 unicorns in southeast asia okay and five is from indonesia and more unicorns are coming from uh, indonesia gojek the one in the middle um i think it reached one billion dollar valuation an investment in um, two years ago, and now it's already four billion dollars uh, worth of business. Okay. Um, this gen again just to show you uh, the strength of Indonesia in the digital market. Okay. In online media, uh, we are the king. Um, online travel again. Um, ride hailing again, and fintech. It's also going up very, very strongly in Indonesia. Now, there is very unique fintech in Indonesia today that, that works very well in my country. This is a page uh, in Bahasa Indonesia, unfortunately. This is um, 
a startup called iGrow. Okay, so iGrow is a startup company that uh, link small farmers with uh, external funding. So the first box on the left it basically says that financing for the food of uh, fish, uh, uh, freshwater fish. So that is two and a half million rupiah, which is what, um, $150, okay? Return 16% per year, contract two years, and you have 202 stocks. And if you go deeper, then you see it's about maybe five farmers on 10 farmers. The one in the middle, the same fish. The one in the corner right is also the same fish. Um, this is the, the result, you know, um, we have, uh, this is in rupiah, but basically I can tell you that 130, 39 million rupiah is somewhere around 15 million US dollar, small, but it covers a lot of farmers in Indonesia. So uh, small farmers, small fishermen, they can, they can have financing through iGro without necessarily going to the bank. So this is a very unique solutions. And um, this company iGro receive all kinds of accolades across the world. And uh, it has been, you know, one of the best uh, 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 startup in Indonesia today. So where are we going uh, from now? Okay, so uh, we got our independence in 1945. So in 2045, we will be 100 years uh, of age. So we want to, these are the four big pillars. The one on the left is human development. The one then sustainable economic development and equitable uh, development and national resilience and governance. So if you look at this different aspect, the narrative is actually one, which means that uh, we want to have Indonesia, which is modern, but sustainable and equitable. So that is the idea. We are not a country who, who are going to destroy the environment. We want to increase the capability of Indonesian people uh, in the science, technology, education, so that they will enjoy equitable development. And also we have a strong uh, national economy with industry. Uh, in the future. So this is where we're going. Now, uh, the question is how, right? So you know all this uh, element that I mentioned before, so we, you know where we are going. And the how is um, true industry. This is just a picture to show you that uh, the how to go there is industry. That's why we are joining uh, Hanover Fair in such a big way. But industry that uh, respect the environment. So green growth. So I'll go dive to climate uh, change policy now. We are committed to Paris Agreement, uh, absolutely committed. And that number in the middle, 29%, it tells us that we are committed to reduce our green gas house by 29% alone, or what they call the business as usual. If international uh, support comes in, we can even take it down to 41%. On the, on the, let me go back a little bit, okay? Um, when people talk about the environment in Indonesia, normally they talk about the forest, but they forget that Indonesia is the largest archipelagic state in the world. So our environmental issue are ocean number one, um, forest number two, and peatland uh, uh, number three. So these are the three important aspects of, of our environmental uh, uh, challenges. So I will start with ocean. We used to have problem with illegal fishing, okay? A lot of foreign vessels coming in. And we had a tough measure. And it's so tough that we sink uh, almost 500 foreign fishing vessels. Um, this is a very interesting vessel for, for discussion point. This is called the, the Viking. It's, it's a poaching vessels uh, that take Patagonia toothpaste in the southern part of the Atlantic. It's a very big vessel. Okay? And when we arrested this vessel, this vessel has 
fishing nets with the length of 399 kilometers. So I want you to, to imagine a little bit yourself in this vessel, okay? You are fishing with a net of 399 kilometers. Imagine the destruction that you create when you took the net of this far. This vessel has eight flags and this vessel has seven nationalities. So this is criminal vessels and um, you know, we blew them up uh, as an example, okay? It was arrested in different countries and released, but when we arrested the vessel, we said that we want to make a very clear uh, example of uh, thieves and illegal fishing. So, you know, for deterrence uh, aspect. Now, ocean, we have problem with um, marine plastic debris. We, this is something that we face uh, in Indonesia, but we have a commitment to reduce marine plastic debris and we have a lot of project with the World Bank uh, at the regional level. And I'm going to show you um, one river called Chitaron River. The river is 300 kilometers long and this used to be the source of plastic from land going to the sea, all right? This is the picture before and there is the picture after after we do the cleanup. This is a cleanup in just six months, okay? This is before, how terrible it was, yeah? You can actually walk on the plastic on the river. And this is after. This is before, this is after. Look at the before picture. Those are people who are actually trying to get some, you know, um, fish or they do some get garbage collection, but you know, this is something that we, we managed to clean up the river uh, in Indonesia. So we have also launched our ocean policy and this ocean policy uh, becomes a important reference for Indonesia to do our, our uh, ocean policy uh, comprehensively. Now, we have done a calculations on uh, how much it's gonna cost actually to fight uh, climate change. This is uh, for, for finance people uh, uh, to have a look. So this is a very interesting calculation that we have done. Okay, We actually need $81 billion to uh, combat climate change with mitigation and adaptations. We don't have that kind of money for that kind of project. We only have $55 billion. So we have still about you know 30 billion short. So what we did is to launch a green bond. This is an Islamic green bond. Okay. Um, we just did it um, in uh, 2018 in March, and we got 1.2 billion US dollar. And uh, this is last year, I was involved in this launching of the Green Circle in Frankfurt, 2.2 billion uh, US dollar. And this is something new that we are developing, uh, a carbon credit mechanism. I'm working with some uh, German NGO and uh, we have also discussion with uh, big German automakers on this carbon credit mechanism. So it's, uh, we are creating the framework, uh, how the pricing is going to be done, how is the certification is going to be done, uh, and how is uh, this project will relate to the uh, local community and how we can then use this as a reporting mechanism for the agreement. So this is something new. Um, we are the only one, I would say, in Asia who is doing this. Probably very few countries in the world. I'm not, not so sure. Um, US, maybe. Uh, I don't have any idea, but uh, I think we are very one of the very few countries who are developing carbon credit mechanism. This is the potential of our carbon credit. Um, mangrove. Um, forestry and also peatland. We have a report on the uh, ocean, uh, or sorry, on, on, in addition to ocean, we are reporting on the forest as well. 
and um, we have established a peatland restoration agency. Okay, um, we have restored two million hectares of uh, peatland, um, and um, you know this is uh, uh, just go straight through uh, the result of our policy. So our deforestation deforestation dropped by sixty percent. Uh, this is not what we said. This is what the World Resources Institute uh, is basically saying. So if I said it, then it's become propaganda. So it's better to get uh, someone else to, to say it, that you know, it's, we have been successful. Uh, the, primary, the primary forest loss in protected peat is also went down. Okay, So then we can bring this up to the issue of carbon mechanisms. Um, this is a, a fact, a number about uh, from university about the forest fires. You have forest fire now in the US, in Australia, in different parts of the world. That the forest fire in Indonesia is, is basically, um, you know, very very low uh, in 2020. This is very interesting. Uh, while probably you heard that. Um, uh, some NGOs still say that Indonesia has a lot of deforestation. Member of European Parliament are saying the same thing, but we work with Norway, and Norway is just paid us fifty-six million dollars uh, as a very clear uh, paper of performance projects under the Paris Agreement. So, in one hand, you will hear someone from Brussels in European Parliament saying that. Indonesia is creating deforestation, but Norway came and you know gave us money, saying that we are successful in fighting deforestation. So um, you know, talk is cheap, of course, um, and uh, uh, this is a very good example on the, how people can actually work together. Because when we talk about bilateral cooperation, working together, you know, politician normally comes up with big words, but um, this is an example of dollarizing what you say. It's not a big word. Just, uh, there's one very interesting movie yeah, in the US, I forget the movie called, called Show Me Your Money. <laughs> okay. So this is uh, uh, one of the very interesting aspects in fighting deforestation, so where we are working hard so if you want to respect us, just show me your money and give it to us. So then you'll do more better than that. Um, another very interesting aspect in, in, in the deforestation, uh, we have this call uh, 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 timber regulations okay, to fight illegal logging. We signed with EU uh, in 2016. So we have this already in place. Uh, NGO will come the legal wood from Indonesia to the EU, okay? But European industry still buy from China. Nothing against China on this particular thing, but EU industry still buy wood not coming from a flag T country or not coming from a country that has signed deal with the EU about fighting deforestation. Interestingly enough, this is also good for finance people to look at this. There's an article in the treaty that we signed with the EU, they call the market incentive. And uh, the market incentive uh, mentioned that public and private procurements in EU must recognize uh, legally harvested timber Indonesian product. So I wrote letters to um, all uh, minister presidents. And I asked them about what about your uh, procurement policies in Germany. And uh, three replied, the rest didn't reply. One said, we don't know, we don't really care. Um, the other said, well, it's a great idea, but we buy from somewhere else. And there is another one who said, we don't believe in you. So it's very interesting exercise where we have been working hard in fighting deforestations, but in EU, you know, things are still frustrating sometimes, but we are working on it. So um, we have now 120 million hectares of forest area, 63% of our total area in Indonesia is still quite big. Now I'm going to take you to probably one of the most contentious issue with the EU, which is palm oil. Uh, um, 
palm oil in general only occupies 0.3 percent of agriculture and land in the world so uh, there are five billion hectares in the world and palm oil is just 0.3 percent okay um, this is a data from um, german company uh, that does analysis on uh, vegetable oil so totally there are 550 million tons okay that produce being produced uh, by 280 million hectares of land producing vegetable oils and the indonesian vegetable oil is only 30 percent of these 280 million around the world so it's only four percent okay it's very small in terms of area of vegetable oil and it's very efficient oils uh, per hectare will yield more than if you get uh, you know different like rub seed sunflower or so space for this uh, uh, vegetable oil land the expansion is very clear looking at this graph the expansions of land for vegetable oils is increasing in soybean, rapeseed, and sunflower. Palm oil is the lowest. Um, and the European Parliament decided to ban palm oil coming up in a couple of years. And if they ban palm oil, then they have to fill the uh, gap with other oil, which means there are deforestation in other places of the world. Um, and interestingly enough, we have 12 million supply of sustainable palm oil and European demand is only 5.8 million tons. So the question is that in financial way and environmental way, why do you buy all these 12 million? You know, you only need 5.8. You can just buy all of them and then, uh, you know, you, you can use all the sustainable palm oil with you. But uh, I don't think the issue is about the environmental issue, it's about market competition not so much here in germany but in france it's very sensitive and very emotional issue because we all know that french subsidies uh, of farming is very high and anything relation to palm oil is you know it's being attacked demonstrated uh, in in france and um well if you don't have palm oil then you buy from the us so then the issue is not really so much about um, environment and vegetable oil, but uh, how you make a trade-off uh, because some of the EU product is being threatened by the US, so then you make a trade-off of in that regard. So, thank you. So, um, you have just seen 100 slides and I hope uh, you're not bored or, or you're probably sleepy, so... Um, I just fly through these uh, slides and uh, hopefully we have a good chat uh, after this. Thank you very much. I will mute myself. I will continue. I will continue, Your Excellency. Uh, it was not boring at all what, I, what we are talking. It was amazing and very interesting. And we all have got a very valuable insights into uh, the economy and the current situation in Indonesia. It was very impressing. Of course, the size of the country, the demographics, the current growth rate, it's uh, amazing to know. And uh, was also remarkable, I found for, for myself, it's uh, that uh, you mentioned that you have more unicorn companies as some European countries uh, can have or have. Uh, you also have a viable fintech sector. This, I think, very interesting for us. And especially what I found uh, really good and a good example also for Germany and for the rest of the world is your program with the Islamic Green Bonds to improve their environmental issues. So thank you very much for your very interesting presentation. And then I would like to open the... Uh, Q&A session, and I would start with the first question, which uh, I would like to summarize, uh, because uh, many participants ask the same question, uh, which is, um, what would you um, recommend the foreign investors 
uh, if they decided to come to Indonesia and to start their own company, how difficult it is, how risky it is, and how difficult or easier to get back the money. Well, if you want to get the money fast, then you have to look at a different aspect of the economy. But uh, if you really want to go, go in and you don't have want you don't want to create a headache of having factories, then startup is the place to go. Okay, uh, startup is uh, a very good aspect for you to invest and come uh, to Indonesia. And uh, you decide which type of startup, and it's not uh, it's not very difficult uh, at all. And it's uh, imagine uh, 275 million uh, market, okay. And uh, we have a very strong data showing that uh, we are looking at um, around 125 million people have a mobile phone. So transactions are being done by mobile phone these days. So uh, internet banking is very strong and uh, connectivity is very strong. So startup, I think, will be the place for you to see. Uh, and you want to go, if you want to go something uh, more complicated than startup, then the hospital, okay? Uh, COVID has opened up uh, a lot of possibility for, for uh, international investment to invest in hospitals. Uh, we are still lack of a hospital uh, because of uh, the country is size is so big. Um, another way to invest is um, tourism hotel. Okay, uh, that's uh, another way for you to invest. We have a lot of uh, now. I have seen um, a lot of uh, small investors uh, in Europe coming to Indonesia, uh, getting. Uh, many small investment here and there in tourism so there are a, a lot of area where you can work um, return it uh, depends yeah on which area that you're working on so um, i would say i cannot say a certain percentage but um, if you are in farming then it's around 16 uh, percent or so um, in startup it's it is then it's, it's it depends on what what uh, game you are in so i hope that clear up uh, and if if you really are serious, then you can just come come to the embassy, and we can have a chat uh, on with particular aspect. We will be uh, giving you all kind of helps that uh, you need to to start the business process, to invest the business process, and so on and so forth. We have now two hundred fifty German companies in Indonesia, and uh, the good thing about German companies in Indonesia is that they normally have factories. So they have Indonesian workers. So they're not mm -hmm. just some uh, shops that uh, you know. It's like a, some some countries they come and they have just one shop, one guy, and that's it. For Indonesia, it's basically uh, a lot of uh, infrastructure and um, lots of um, factories involved. Thank yeah, you, you mentioned an yeah, you mentioned you mentioned in your presentation that uh, those international investors who uh, educate and employ the local workers uh, receive the tax benefits, and I think it's a very smart mm -hmm. decision of the Indonesian government uh, to have an economic stimulus uh, to bring the foreign business and uh, their domestic uh, industry together. Um, I yeah. would like to uh, give a possibility to the students to ask their questions. I know that some of them already prepared the questions. Um, uh, I think Caleb, he had some questions. If it would be possible to make him free and then followed by Shail and Chris. Do we have such possibility? Yeah, I think I have the possibility now. Oh, okay, wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so my ahead first, go ahead. Um, my first question was, um, which industries do you see most of the startups um, kind of moving towards? Like, where do you see most of the startups? Which industry? Health. Health service. That's uh, going very strong now. Uh, for, I'll give you an example. Uh, um, uh, there is a there is a, an app called Allo Doctor. Okay, uh, uh, 
A L O D O C T O R, Aldo Doctor, is health doctor. So we want to take a, a swab test of uh, of vaccine. Uh, sorry, swab test for COVID. You just uh, download the app and then the, you choose where you live. You just uh, choose where the place you want to go. You tap 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 and then uh, you got the appointment. It, it didn't happen before. Now it's happening and um, you get the result very quick. You can go to the place very quick. So um, this is something that is booming. So people are now moving into these directions now. Okay. Um, and then I have another question, if that's okay. Um, yes, please. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the palm oil industry. Do you see the demand for palm oil from Indonesia increasing in the future? Yeah, um, because uh, of the biofuel. Uh, so we are uh, now at the level of 50%. So uh, we are moving at uh, hopefully at one point uh, 80 to 90 percent of palm oil as uh, biofuel. But the demand for food, of course, is very high uh, in Indonesia. The demand for uh, cooking oil, the demand for other purposes are very high. Uh, so this and, and also we are not expanding uh, the land. So we have now uh, 13 to 14 million hectares stopped as a moratorium. So the government now is uh, providing funding for uh, smallholders, for farmers, uh, to have a good seeds. So we have uh, 13 to 14 million hectares of uh, land for palm oil in Indonesia. 49% are owned by smallholder. Smallholders mean you have half hectare, one hectare, just two maximum. Okay. And then the rest is owned by state-owned companies and private companies. So majority of the owners are smallholders. So we are, one, we are not expanding the land. So in order to anticipate the demand uh, at domestic level, so we are giving them uh, for free uh, a very good seeds. Uh, a, a normal seed now today, one hectare, you can get maybe uh, three tons or so but with the very good seeds uh, with the same hectare you get eight to nine uh, ton uh, of oil per year so increase increase efficiency that's what we're looking at all right yeah uh, and then I, my final question was um, i'm from the united states so do you see yeah. trade with the united states um increasing uh, due to regime changes in the United States, or do you see that kind of remaining the same uh, when uh, regime changes occur? Uh, it's increasing actually, um, uh, quite substantially in, in different uh, segments, um, in, in some products is increasing. Uh, and uh, we hope that uh, the new uh, government will then be able to join with us in the um, the trade deal. Now we have just uh, ratified the RCEP, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnerships. It's like uh, TPP. And uh, we have Australia, New Zealand, Indonesia, ASEAN, China, South Korea, uh, part of that. So, so we hope that uh, when you have a new government in the US, we can, we can work on that. Now we are negotiating with the, with the EU on uh, economic partnership as well. I was involved uh, with the negotiations as the vice chief uh, until uh, mid this year. Mm -hmm. All right. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much. So before Shail will ask her question, I would like to ask the question which we received via Facebook. This is the question from uh, the person from Indonesia. Who, will, uh, who has followed our conversation today. And the question is uh, if there, there are any investments in education between Indonesia mm. and Germany, any startups, any types of cooperation. Yeah, education is also open for um, foreign investments in Indonesia. Actually, you have already a Swiss German school in Jakarta, you have um, Lycée Francais in Jakarta, you have 
JIS, Jakarta International School, uh, you have Montessori, you have Singapore School, you know, you have a lot of uh, international schools already in Jakarta, a lot. I would say there are more international schools in Jakarta than in Berlin. And um, this is open now for, you know, inter international cooperation has been a while, so it's possible, yeah. Mm -hmm. And in with the Germany, I can add that uh, we have seven thousand uh, Indonesian students in Germany. Um, we have about um, one hundred Indonesian engineers working in Airbus. So we have a very long traditions of uh, uh, education uh, cooperation with with Germany. Uh, uh, there is very interesting interesting story, Professor Anna. Uh, in 1951, when Indonesia nationalized uh, Dutch uh, companies, uh, because Dutch was our former uh, colony, uh, the Dutch government was very, very angry. And in 1951, the Dutch government uh, said that they will expel all Indonesian students in Netherlands. Okay, and um, you know they they all most of them they went to Germany. Uh, some they went to France, some they went to UK, but uh, many of them they went to Germany because it was very close. And I think all of them who studied in Maastricht they just walked to Aachen, for instance. So uh, uh, we have a lot of Indonesian students uh, in Germany since 1951. So it's a, it's quite historic in terms of. Uh, the relations between Indonesia and Germany in education. Yeah, even at Turo College Berlin, we also have Indonesian students. So this is oh. actually very nice and we like this diversity. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, Shail, please ask your questions, but keep it short. And um, I would encourage everyone to, to ask no more than two questions. I know that uh, there are plenty of interesting things we can discuss today, but because of our time limit, we have to stick to maximum two questions. Hi, yes, all right. Hi, hello, um, greetings. Um, hello. So my questions are, uh, what is your priority countries for production of food in Indonesia? Is in Latin America or European countries? Because you have a lot of relation with Pacific and Asian associations. Well, um, our challenge is that we got a lot of people, 275 million people, okay? So, the food priority, I think, is for what we call the self-reliance, okay? And uh, the most important staple food, of course, is rice for us. And um, but rice is not good, personally. You know, I don't eat rice because it's have a lot of uh, sugar, a lot of calorie and carbohydrate. So um, there's a lot of no campaign for people to have diversity in the uh, main staple food. Uh, so people are now moving to different different type of uh, staple food. So that's, that's one. And then, um, you know, there are other type of staple food that are uh, important for us and then protein, of course. Uh, we have a very good increase of protein in fish, uh, not so much in uh, cattle because we don't have that many cattle in Indonesia as opposed to Australia or here in Europe. Uh, our consumption of fish is uh, one of the highest in the world. Now it's about 37 kilograms per person per year. And um, other uh, you know, food stuff that uh, we still import, um, some of the food stuff, um, uh, to to Indonesia, uh, you know, it's, the the challenge of Indonesia, of course, is the land uh, is not is very limited as opposed to the sea. So that's why we are looking more uh, to the sea as a source of food uh, for us uh, in Indonesia. All right, thank you. Um, and then my second and last question is, what is the justice system for the repatriation of the money? Um, I think you can just repatriate your money if you invest in Indonesia, as far as I know. It's just, it says no, um, there is no prohibition whatsoever. Uh, I mean, 
look at the big boys, Mercedes, BMW, Siemens, um, American the investor in Indonesia, they do a lot of repatriations of, of funding. So it's not it's not really a big deal for us. Uh, uh, you know, for, for us, the most important thing is to create uh, an environment for investment so that, uh, you know, uh, investor will come and easily set up business, set up shops in Indonesia. They create factories, they create jobs for Indonesian and they maintain the economy. And if they want to repatriate, then it's, it's not a big deal for us. The big issue that we face today is the online, the foreign online um, business, um, Google uh, and the like in terms of taxation. So that is still a big headache for us. It's a big headache here in, in Europe as well. But uh, you know, we 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 are we are looking at it now. Um, we have new development now. You have uh, YouTubers, okay. You have chaps in Indonesia who have a follower of 18 million and they're making a big money out of it and uh, they don't pay tax. So the Minister of Finance, I think yesterday, was she was quite furious and asked those new, new YouTubers to pay taxes. <laughs> yeah, the same yeah, issues in Germany. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, that's true. So uh, the next questions uh, are for Chris. And uh, in the meantime, when uh, the Chris uh, will have an access to our chat, I would like to ask you the question which we received via Facebook again. Uh, the participant asked if you would recommend to wait uh, for the investment in the new capital, which is planned to build close to Jakarta. Yeah, um, investment in new capital, I think uh, the great way is uh, e-mobility, okay, because the president wants this capital to have very low emissions, okay, and mm -hmm. he's very careful location, is not cutting down, uh, you know, prison forest, and uh, well, actually, it's... It, it's a big project, but if you look at the scale of Indonesia, it's not that big. And, uh, and civil servant is not that much uh, because you see, Prof, the uh, political system of Indonesia is now very much regionalized, okay? So for instance, uh, the Ministry of Fisheries, they don't have offices in the provinces, okay? So, um ministry the only ministry that the offices in the regional is the ministry of finance especially the custom and the ministry of immigration uh ministry of law especially the immigration so um the bureaucracy in jakarta actually is very small okay ministry of foreign affairs my office my home office we only have four thousand people um, 2,000 diplomat, 1,000 abroad, 1,000 inside. So we are logging just 3,000 people. So when we all move to a new capital, so actually it's not that much uh, in terms of the amount of people. Mm -hmm. So um, the big investment, I think, is the green investment in the new capital. E-mobility is a great one if you want to uh, uh, invest in the new capital. Okay, thank you very much. Now, Chris, it's your turn and you will be followed by Jennifer. Uh, hello, Ambassador. Good evening to you. Good evening, Chris. Hi. Um, so, um, yeah, my question was, uh, I'm, I would uh, term myself an amateur uh, currency investor, currency speculator. So I am indeed yeah. curious about the rupiah as a currency investment, it is something I have looked at. You took my question, but it's mm. very nice. Yeah, I also <laughs> marked this question. Mm -hmm. Well, my son also in this game, so... <laughs> 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 my oldest son in this financial uh, I don't know, Chris, Who I have not, no idea. Not. We all are on the market, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, so, I suppose, uh, yeah. I have not idea. So I asked my son, okay, he's doing, he's playing this, this, uh, uh, my daughter, she's a lawyer. My son, she, uh, my son is basically unemployed. 
in my in my in my opinion, he's unemployed because he is run this uh, apps here and there with his friend, and he uh, he sold his startup, uh, making some probably millions, and he stay at home. It's his new his new it's a new deal, prof. And now he's in this business of uh, of the currency trade and. Uh, Frankly, I have no idea, uh, but uh, in general, rupiah is quite stable. Uh, hiccups up and down a little bit here and there. Sometimes a hiccup because of the US dollar um, and some political development in the region, but I think so far it's, it should be okay. But, uh, you know, I yeah, have to you be frank it. with you. You, know, I'm, I'm, you mentioned the inflation rate is with 2.7 percent it's of course very low yeah, yeah. and it makes and let's make the currency relatively stable yeah yeah it's it, it's it's stabilized uh, uh since i don't know a couple of uh decades or so yeah mm -hmm. and the currency stability is of course the crucial question for the international investments yeah so that's why it's good yeah. to know mm -hmm. yeah uh, okay. Yeah. Thanks for that. And uh, yeah, my second question is is uh, pertaining to China. So I think um, there is some uh, there's some reason to believe that there's a, a some political antipathy towards China uh, as a result of this uh, crisis. And I wondered what sort of industries Indonesia can fill a potential uh, vacuum that comes with. Um, with turning away from Chinese commerce. I did uh, see uh, before um, uh, coming online to today that uh, the Chinese uh, fishing market is triple that of Indonesia, despite the fact that Indonesia is the second biggest fishing country on the planet. So anyway. Yeah, so um, I think um, in terms of our business with China, um, I think it's true with many other countries uh, in the region, even Europe and even the United States. Um, we have a growing trade with China. Um, China is also important players of investment in Indonesia, but not yet uh, the biggest. Uh, you will be surprised the largest investment in Indonesia is not uh, from China, it's from Singapore, which probably I have to rephrase, through Singapore, <laughs> not from Singapore. <laughs> it's just like, uh, if you look at the data, uh, the largest source of investment from Europe is from Luxembourg, which is probably correctly phrased through Luxembourg, not from Luxembourg, okay? The same thing. Exactly. So, um, <laughs> Yeah, so maybe even the money coming from Indonesia to Singapore going back to Indonesia, I have no idea. Uh, China has a lot of investment to Indonesia. And um, there's a couple of big issues uh, in relation to Chinese investment in Indonesia. And one of them is about the Belt and Road Initiative. Okay, um, People are afraid that uh, the case with uh, Sri Lanka, for instance, or the case with some countries in Africa uh, will create some imbalances uh, in terms of investment and trade between China and Indonesia. So when I was deputy minister, uh, before I came to Berlin, we established a framework, Chris, a framework of investment uh, cooperation with China. And first and foremost, we are not taking any loan from China. That's the first rule. If China want to come and invest, China come and invest business to business. No loan whatsoever. We take loan from the Germans, but not China. Okay. <laughs> we take loan from Washington, but not from China. We take loan from Japan, but not from China. It's a totally different ball game. So business to business. So uh, big investment coming in, for instance, in nickel. Uh, uh, downstream nickel, not the mining itself, but the downstream nickel investment. Uh, $5 billion came in, uh, I think three or four years ago, and uh, it's all business to business. Number three, um, environmentally friendly. We don't want to bring an investment that destroys the environment. Number four, we want to have the first rate technology from China, not the second rate, not the third rate. I mean, 
it's it's common knowledge you know if you if you buy things from china then um, you can you can choose Chris, the first rate, second rate, third rate, you know, you can buy Pinarello, you can buy Chinarello, the, the <laughs> bicycle, for instance. So <laughs> you can buy Bianchi of uh, maybe 12,000 euro, you can buy Chianchi, $500. So it's, uh, we don't want that. We, we, we yeah, we, we, we want to, these are the frame, okay, of, uh, of uh, cooperation with, with, with China. So and we uh, we told them, you know, nicely, transparently, openly, that this is the rules of the games. You want to come with us? Please, 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 please come. If, if not, it's okay. We can bring some some other investors. So we are quite uh, fortunate in terms of location, in terms of the size of the people, um, uh, you know, and also in terms of history. Um, very interesting uh, history, Chris. Uh, in 1233, we have a king in East Java, and the king received uh, uh, received guest from southern China, and the guest said that you're part of our, um, you know, you're part of our influence, so you pay tribute. And the king said, "No, I'm sorry, I'm, I don't know you. I'm not going to pay tribute." Second year, the chap came again, the king refused. The third year, uh, the chap king came again and the king was angry, so he cut his ears and uh, tell the emissary, go to your king and tell them never come to my country again. After four years, the, the, the king in southern China came and uh, to Indonesia with 10,000 troops and um, they tried to uh, invade us and uh, they lost. So we have a history, so and they know it. So you know, we respect each other, and that's why we are quite uh, comfortable in dealing with uh, China, in the past and in the future. Very, very interesting. I now have a, a, a history research project on my in my notebook. Thank you. Please, please do. Please. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much. And now I would like to pass the word to our Indonesian student, to Jennifer. She is uh, she is actually a psychology student, but she is interested in business as well. I'm sorry, Professor Pipston. She said that she cannot uh, read her questions. So if you can read instead of her. Oh yes. Okay. Okay. I will. I will do it with pleasure. So the Jennifer first uh, she wanted to thank uh, His Excellency, uh, the Ambassador, for amazing presentation of uh, the, the country. She is very, very uh, happy about that. And her question is, how does the government handle the fact that actually a lot of young Indonesian people uh, wanted to go abroad and work outside of Indonesia? So how to combat this situation? Yeah, I've, um, we don't have any particular, um, you know, um, look, um, you know, in the old days, people talk about brain drain, okay? I'm mm -hmm. looking at brain circulation problem, not draining. I'll give you an example. So in 1951, we have these uh, Indonesian students in Maastricht who just walk and study in Aachen. Then he studied aerospace and he studied aeronautics. And then um, he became uh, the director of Bolko Messerschmitts. And then he became uh, the director of um, safety in Airbus. And then he became our president. Okay. So the fact that we have Indonesian students uh, living in Europe, studying and becoming a very smart person and very useful here. It, it should be okay and fine with us. And uh, if he wants to go home and serve the country, then you know that's that's what that's what actually happened to uh, Professor Habibi. Uh, he he had a house here in München and in Hamburg. He goes to Germany very often. He speaks very very fluent German, of course, and he is our president in Indonesia. And uh, when he was uh, minister in Indonesia, he sent a thing at that time up to 14,000 Indonesian students studying in Germany uh, in different fields, okay? And uh, many of them returned home 
and uh, built uh, Dirgantara Indonesia, uh, an aero aerospace company that built aircrafts. I'm not so sure whether you know uh, in, in, the, in the meeting tonight, uh, we build aircraft as well. You know, the helicopter of Airbus is all built by us in Indonesia with engineers who studied in Germany. And, um, you know, if kids wants to study abroad, fine. I'm not, I study in the US, it's okay. I work in a law firm in the US and um, I found it horrible. <laughs> so then I decided to go home. <laughs> Very good, very well, motivating stories. <laughs> Wonderful. So now I would like to um, ask the questions which we receive also from the Indonesian citizens via Facebook from Yudit Rahadian. Uh, and then after this question, I would like to give a room for Nikita and Sarah's questions. So the Yudit Rahadian, she asked, um, uh, many her German colleagues, she lives in Berlin, she's Indonesian, and uh, she, many of her German colleagues ask uh, how competitive is Indonesia in regard to G, uh, 5G, 5G technologies, artificial mm -hmm. intelligence, and the digital economy. Well, partially you uh, already uh, answered this question with, uh, in your presentation, but maybe uh, a little bit more words about 5G and artificial intelligence. Yeah, 5G is not yet there. Uh, you have to be frank, uh, like in many of the countries, uh, we are still working on the existing uh, infrastructure and uh, because of the islands uh, spreading so a network is still very important to, to spread on different islands. So it's a, we're not there yet. Um, we have some research and development, uh, some academics, uh, uh, some universities have done some research on 5G uh, made in uh, Indonesia, but uh, I'm not so sure how this will come up uh, this year or even next year, okay? Um, AI, we have started to do some uh, AI. There are already some factories in Indonesia who have done AI and implemented in different uh, type of uh, works. Um, uh, Adidas has the most um, recent, most modern AI-based um, automation factory in Indonesia. Okay. Um, with Indonesian technology, I was told by the owner uh, of this uh, of this factory. So, uh, very interestingly, the CEO Adidas uh, uh, went to Bali for vacation, but he did not know that in the just 200 kilometers from Bali, you have a factory that runs the most automated Adidas factory. And then we took them uh, to the factory, and they were shocked. And, uh, you know, then uh, he realized that Indonesia is a country of full potential. So, yeah, we are, we are already on the way of uh, AI. So imagine with this going on and with the power of Indonesia on the digital economy in the regions and the strong of demography. And I think, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's the right way to, to move forward uh, if you want to come and invest in this uh, new type of technology. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. So we have 10 minutes left and we have still three questions to answer. So that's why I would like to everyone to keep the questions short. So the next question is from Nikita. Yes, thank you much, Professor. Um, dear Ambassador, my question to you is, um, in terms of renewable energy sources, do you see future and more investment into renewable energy sources in Indonesia? As you have mentioned, solar power, uh, being a very important source of renewable energy for Indonesia and more specifically also do you think then there would be an increased usage of um, electric powered cars in Indonesia as a result of a higher usage and higher application of uh, renewable energy sources in the country? Yes. <laughs> That's the answer to get Yes, and yes, and yes. So, um, yes, we have uh, uh, already put an investment in renewable energy. Um, we have uh, 
American investment, we have Danish investment already in renewable energy. Um, I'm working a lot to bring a lot of German in the uh, renewable energy. We managed to get um, funding from Germany, 2.3 billion euro for green infrastructure initiative. Um, so it can be in different types of uh, infrastructure, including uh, green energy. Um, this is not charity. This is um, investment and loans. So again, this is for an investment uh, for um, you know, renewable energy. Um, when I was um, in Jakarta, I had a trip once uh, to South Korea where they are developing a floating solar panel um, on the beaches. So this is something that we are looking at as well. Uh, there's a new project going on uh, in eastern part of Indonesia. So there are two islands uh, that are so close uh, uh, and it's only 500 meters, uh, the distance between these two islands. And the water in these two islands in between happens to be very, very strong. So now we are building a bridge, but below the bridge, we are putting a turbine and uh, it can produce up to five gigabyte. And, uh, 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 and this uh, will uh, be uh, used to the region in the Eastern part of Indonesia. Yeah, renewable is something that we are, we are, we, we are looking at. The challenge now is the pricing. Okay, um, that's why in my presentation, I mentioned about uh, the new presidential regulation on the pricing of renewable energy. So if you talk about the pricing uh, of renewable energy, coal is around four cents per kilowatt. So sometimes it's, it's cheaper, but if we can bring uh, cheaper or a comparable renewable like five or six then we can we can still handle it some project uh, nikita in jakarta i was involved in this uh, project is waste to energy um, we are even willing to buy 12 cent kilowatt per hour uh, as as long as we are cleaning up the garbage so this is a it's a new uh, investment uh, type of investment and uh, you know i think uh, you can be part of it if you like to. There is a very interesting small scale investment, just 5 million euros, uh, run by outfit from Munich. So if you go to a website uh, called uh, Systemic, S Y S T M I Q, Systemic. Systemic is having a small project in uh, East Java, Indonesia on uh, waste management so that they will reduce the plastic going to the sea. It's not renewables as such, but this is a new type of investment that you might be thinking of uh, looking at in Indonesia. Thanks. Thank you very much, okay. dear Ambassador. I just wanted to mention very quickly, you've also answered my second question in terms of foreign investment for renewable energy sources. Yeah, so we, have, we have already. Uh, yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening. There are interesting reports on coconut import investment opportunities by CBI.eu. I'm curious about your insights on this market. We have um, some export of uh, um, coconut products uh, to Europe. Uh, but it's only on the very niche market, on the bio market. And um, we have brought this uh, uh, exporter from Indonesia to, 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 to Germany uh, in different uh, show and trade shows. Um, it's, um, it's a very good uh, business, a very good prospect is increasing, but it's not uh, you know, very high uh, in terms of volumes. You know, the pricing is okay. Uh, but then we have a competition from the Philippines, we have competition from Vietnam, we have competition from Thailand and other countries uh, in, from Africa. From Africa, the competition is because they are closer, so they can come with a lower price. So I think in general, uh, in quality-wise, our coconut uh, product 
uh, in Indonesia, whether it's um, uh, coconut oil or uh, different types of coconut, uh, it's it's entering already, but uh, the the number is not is not very big. Okay. Yes, I'm sorry, but I think that Professor Clifton was uh, disconnected, uh, unfortunately. But I would like to wrap it up and thank you very much for your um, lecture and insights, deep insights that uh, you gave us. Um, and I'm sure that all the viewers, we have a lot uh, agree. Thank you very much. And you're welcome. And as you suggested, uh, we will send you people to uh, see how it's possible to start investing in Indonesia. Okay. All right. So if you need anything, uh, any more questions, uh, concrete questions, then uh, please come by. We have our team in the embassy uh, who will, you know, uh, be able to, to help you. Uh, on many different aspects uh, of question that have, you've not been able to uh, ask uh, tonight and I not been able to answer tonight or any other issue on the um, you know economy or latest development uh, and uh, I think especially on the latest policies where Indonesia uh, has managed to to streamline uh, different uh, difficulties before bureaucratic difficulties issue in relations to, um, you know, contract between um, in, uh, Indonesian companies or uh, with foreign investments, uh, dispute settlement mechanisms in Indonesia and, and all those kind of stuff. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all for watching and uh, to connect with us.